relocated to head up this very prestigious outfit called the School for Oriental and African Studies. All of us would have given a limb to get a degree from SOAS, as it's called, at the University of London. Uh, it is a massive, um, uh, 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 I think, privilege uh, for Adam to be there, and 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 they're very lucky to have him as a uh, as a leader in higher education. So, um, Adam, welcome. Good to have you in this series on on leader. I know you're running from meeting to meeting. <laughs> and the relocating and furniture and all of that stuff at the same time. Uh, but we wish you well um, uh, in, in that part of the world. So Adam, I, I, just for those uh, uh, on the call, on the Zoom that might not know you, I wonder if I could just ask you to, to talk a little bit about your early years of activism, which, which I, I suppose I'm happy to say was <laughs> was not with Congress politics. It was not, it was very much uh, with the progressive left. Um, uh, uh, I know Cape Town was, was part of that, uh, that early exposure, uh, uh, et cetera. Tell us about your roots and, and particularly your first instincts uh, of leadership as a young man. So uh, firstly, thank you, Jonathan, and thank you for inviting me. And it's a real pleasure to be, to be having this conversation. Um, so perhaps, where do I start? Uh, you know, born as a kind of middle-class Indian South African in the, in the middle of Peter Maritzburg in KwaZulu-Natal. And uh, very quickly in the 1980 boycotts that uh, largely affected Indian and colored schools in the Western Cape and KwaZulu-Natal, uh, I became uh, very quickly politicized. And when I became politicized, I became politicized in an organizational formation independent of the Congress movement. So if you like the, what was then known as the unity movement, through the unity movement, I went into working with the unions and from the unions, I went working with, if you like one or other form of far left party, Neville Alexander's workers for organization for socialist action, et cetera. So in many ways, I was a kind of Trotskyist in, a, uh, in, an, in an earlier life. And that has influenced me in powerful ways. Uh, one, by the fact that social justice is important and equality and inclusion is important. But second, uh, as comes with kind of large left-leaning politics, it was a fractitious arrangement. And so, uh, in a sense, I'm uh, comfortable with fractitious politics and fractitious behavior. And so when that emerges in the post-apartheid South Africa, in the current moment, I'm not completely uh, flummoxed by it. I have learned in an earlier life how to navigate that world. And, and, and so that has influenced me in powerful ways. So that's the first part of my conversation. The second part is really about how I got invo in, uh, involved in academic politics. And that was largely with where you spoke about, Jonathan. We both landed up at the University of Durban Westville in the early 1990s. And that together with the University of Western Cape was one of the first transforming institutions, dramatic transformations, dramatic shift in student profiles, largely poor students coming in and particularly African students coming in into the system. And in that moment, uh, I was particularly involved first um, uh, as an academic, but second as a trade union activist, as somebody who was the secretary general of ComSci in those days, if you remember that structure, yeah, Jonathan. And I remember, and that experience brought to me both positive and negative. First, the energy that, that comes with transforming institutions, the imagination that can come with a diversity in the university community. But what the Comsa experience also showed me is however good intention people might be, you can destroy institutions of learning by not being measured, by not thinking through what you're doing. 
by taking the university and its environment for granted. And all of those things lived with me for many years. And when, uh, in a sense, fees must fall developed and the challenges there, uh, you would remember that I've co constantly went back to the UDW days and said, we must not land up making the very mistakes that were made in the mid 1990s at UDW. Because when I left UDW, I was struck by the fact that there was not a single, there was one professor in the entire faculty of humanities. And that was the Dean. Nobody else had actually survived. And the consequences of that were, were there to see for everybody. And what struck me is I vowed that I would never allow that situation to happen again. And that, uh, if you like, um, stayed with me through Fees Must Fall and it informed my choices in quite powerful ways. And I want to press you on that UW experience in part because it was quite formative for you in your um, subsequent leadership roles, but in part because it was a part of that I couldn't understand. I was a fresh faced PhD coming back into the country, my first academic job. Jairam was at UDW. Jairam Reddy, you might recall, was the, the vice chancellor. And, and in some ways, you and I were on the opposite side. We were friends, but we were on the opposite side of, of politics. You were with Consul, which I thought and still think was a very really destructive union. Um, uh, we were in the Academic Staff Association trying to sort of, you know, um, uh, uh, sort of rescue rescue the place and I couldn't believe what I was seeing you know uh, not so much you but I mean actually the Sai Heidi Bonke or the uh, was it Jacobson or something uh, fellow and they were literally tearing down the place you know and I, yeah. couldn't, I couldn't understand that I couldn't understand how that is progressive politics I couldn't understand you know so so when you reflect about leadership and you know, Jaden really wasn't a conservative vice chancellor. In fact, he was quite an open minded, liberal, I suppose, a uh, decent human being that I can vouch for, and I'm sure you can. And yet, the place, in fact, Nelson, the first government intervention in a university in democracy was UDW. And you might recall that Nelson Mandela, as president, inaugurated the the uh, Gauchi Commission of Inquiry, in which Advocate Johan Gauchi and, and Linda Zama, if I recall Advocate Zama, were sort of had to do an investigation into the upheaval. What was your role in that? Yeah. So what was interesting is that I, I thought that the UDW experience, I had begun it in 1990 as a young junior academic and got very involved in the transformation of UDW. And for two years, uh, two and a half years, I was completely immersed in the union uh, at UDW, which was Comsa, as you well know. And then at that point, I went for a PhD uh, at the City University, the Graduate School of the City University of New York. And actually, I was out of UDW for three years. And in a sense, missed much of the 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 tragedy that played out at UDW uh, when it became really, really violent around when the Academic Staff Association was, was established, etc. I returned, if you like, in 1995 and 1996. And when I came back, I obviously came back to the very union. I, I went in and I was quite struck by how UDW had changed in the space of three years. And the way I saw this uh, was effectively what I saw then emerge, re-emerge in Fees Must Fall. And that was a zero sum politics. So you're absolutely right. Jairam Reddy was a decent human being. He was a good academic with liberal predisposition. But there were a whole series of activists at UDW who saw the university as a Marxist project. And they saw that the university as a Marxist project should carry 
if you like, a Marxist agenda. It should be very clear and articulated in advancing a political cause. It should be very clear in not allowing hierarchy to exist. And therefore, it should not be having uh, people who are professors. It should be very clear in having uh, a salary structure in which everybody was paid uh, within a very narrow band. Uh, all of those kinds of things. And in a sense, what it was about was creating two things in a sense. One was trying to create an, an, a socialist institution in a kind of capitalist society. It's like a complete divorce of the institution from the society in which you locate it. And secondly, to imagine the university as the leverage, as the weak link by which you could launch a broader political project. Now, both those issues, uh, and I remember having these debates with colleagues in Comsa, uh, saying this is undoable. I remember having a meeting with some of the activists in what was then the Senate chamber, and they were saying what we need is dual power. They had just taken Marcus Valentulo who was the vice chancellor and removed him physically from the campus and they had declared themselves vice chancellor and deputy vice chancellor and CFO. And I was remember having a debate with them saying, no state will allow this. You can't think of dual power. This is the word, this is a notion of insurrection that would not be, no state, let alone a democratic state can allow this to happen. And obviously, two, we, two days later or three days later, the police came in, removed everybody, closed the place down, etc. But those, those strands of thinking re-emerged in 2015. I remember having the same debates with colleagues and they were saying, it doesn't matter what we want is free education. And we recognize that you can't get free education unless you fundamentally change society. And the university must be the means by which you effectively launch a broader uh, fundamental shift in society. And if the university loses its calling and if it's sacrificed in, uh, in the process, so be it. Because that, uh, the bigger cause is at play. And that was the first thing that reemerged uh, in 2015. The second that reemerged in 2015 was a zero sum game. It was either you are part of the cause or you're against the cause. There wasn't any understanding about competing priorities. There wasn't any understanding about trade offs that are required to make institutions run well. That if you take fees and you take salaries, you can't do both that they all align and you have to, they fit in a jigsaw puzzle. And if fees go down, or if salaries go up and fees go down, there's no way to close the circle. And those kinds, uh, if you like, normal decision-making was not being considered and people were just refusing to think through. And, hmm. and again, it seems to me that that's, the power, that's why I worry uh, in a lot of ways, UDW in 1995, I could imagine and saw what the consequences of it were. And I wanted to do a void in 2015 and 16 in, in WITS. And effectively, I think we succeeded in that. WITS is standing because we stood down and stared down that kind of zero sum game, that kind of politics that was prepared to sacrifice the university. For, uh, for a broader political cause. And I might add, where middle-class people were thinking that they could do that because they didn't have to live the consequences because the real poor needed that university because it was through that university and the qualification that they could get that they would move, move on to, to change the life circumstances of themselves and their families. And so there was a kind of class indulgence that comes uh, with this that people are not sufficiently aware of and that some of us had in, in the early 1990s and that lesson, if you like, lived with me 
uh, in 2015 and 16. Okay, so we're obviously going to do a deep dive there into leadership in that particular crisis. Um, uh, <laughs> and just one more thing on, on uh, I don't know if I told you this, but one more thing on the UDW connection. Uh, one person who was a particular uh, target of, of the union concert at the time, when you got the job and things were going really very at this, she said to me, man, just do me a favor, tell Adam that this karma is a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, listen, Adam, I don't think a lot of people knew you, I mean, apart from the political science community, the, the activist community, you know, but not a lot of people really knew you the way they know you now, uh, before you went to Tibet. So you were at UJ at one point, applied to to, to um, uh, Tibet, you got the job. I mean, I would have told you at the time, you're crazy, because it is a university in which the political intensity, you know, and UCT doesn't really have, I mean, 2015 was the first time, as you know, in decades, that UCT had a major upheaval. But this has this all the time. I mean, the students there, I don't know if it's the, the history of Soweto and, and the protest movement and all of that, but it gets quite hairy very quickly. Uh, at uh, a place like this. Why did you take the job? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a fair question. I'll, t I'll, I'll speak about why I think WITS is like that. And by the way, in many ways, SOAS is like this in, in some ways. Um, it, I think that I took the job because for me, I, I know it sounds corny, but, you know, I, I, I've always had the belief that our public institutions, we need to make a difference. And that you can make a difference with public institutions in South Africa in a way that you can't do in many other parts of the world. It changes lives. And it changes the lives of generations to follow. And you can do that with powerful public institutions in South Africa in a way that is second to none. And, and that, if you like comes from a kind of social passion, a passion to change the world as an activist. For me, as a political activist, as a student in the 1980s, or as an academic activist in the 1990s, or when I became vice chancellor in 2013 at WITS, all of that was part of my, my, my activism. I saw my vice chancellorship as a part of activism, making an impact on lives, changing lives in some kind of way. And I think we've not understood sufficiently how uh, universities in South Africa can have a dramatic impact in a way that is probably second to none anywhere in the world on the lives of ordinary individuals, on how we make a difference on inequality by simply getting, by simply enabling access and providing a quality education. It's the two that have to go together. Bring them in, but give them a quality education because by that you enable the social mobility and the changes that happen in people's lives and the children's lives once social mobility emerges. And for me, that's the logic. Uh, and that's why I took the job. It was in a sense, I, you know, people laugh about this. I said it in my inaugural address and I said it when I in my farewell. Which was always a political passion. It was never simply a job. And for me, that's what why it was important. And it's true of much of my other jobs. Now, I want to come back to, because I think it's relevant to our conversation. Why is it that Wits was such a fractitious place? Whereas at, at, uh, at least UCT wasn't prior to 2015. And uh, many other places like Stellenbosch and others aren't even today. And I think it's got to do with two things. One is a liberal predisposition, an institution that's committed to a free flow of ideas, to allowing for progressive alternative thoughts. It comes from the traditional liberal uh, tradition of creating a free space for ideas. And in many ways, the English speaking South African universities were very much that. They were kind of, quintessentially English speaking um, and liberal spaces. But as much as there were liberal spaces, 
that liberal space was constrained by the society and what the society allowed in. So white South Africa and the apartheid only allowed certain, so the liberal free space of ideas was contained within parameters. What the transition did is opened up those parameters. And what you suddenly saw is a fundamental demographic shift in the student populace. And where that happened dramatically, that, that free space of ideas, that liberal space was more prone to allowing a demographic shift. And when that happened in quite fundamental ways, uh, that, that demographic shift introduced a new kind of politics, a politics that came from the marginalized, a politics that came from a much more fractitious township environment, a politics that came from where you saw uh, policemen shoot people and kill them on the streets. However radical you may have been in white South Africa, or frankly in Indian South Africa, you didn't have people, policemen walking in and shooting neighbors and killing them. In townships, that's what did happen. And that politics came into the university environment in a way that didn't exist before. And it was that combination of the liberal space and the demographic shift that fundamentally made this a much more potent, politically potent, fractitious environment. UCT didn't do it because its demographic shift was more contained. Uh, and as that demographic shifts, shifts in 2015 in quite powerful ways, that, that semblance of that politics emerges. And it shows you uh, what it, this understanding that often is not sufficiently appreciated by how to manage that and how to transform that. And for me, the grappling with that was essentially the significant learning curve. In, in bits in my role as vice chancellor. Right, I, I'm, I'm, I'm scared we're gonna run out of time because your, the points you make are so incredibly interesting and I don't want to interrupt you. Um, but so, so let me fast forward a little bit. Uh, just to speak to you as, you know, one uh, former vice chancellor to, to another, I have always been struck by the lack of leadership among vice chancellors in our 26 public universities. Half of them are no name brands in, in, in South African public discourse. For example, if I ask this audience, who is the vice chancellor of Northwest, or who is the vice chancellor of um, Salt Reiki, or who is the vice chancellor of the University of Kumalanga, nobody would know actually, okay? And I've always thought that the vice chancellor's position is, is a privileged one in the sense that you've got a platform in which you can bring into the public discourse uh, debates, points of view, perspectives on issues percolating in the broader society. You did that without fear or favor, you know, and you did it in a way that didn't tick off completely, you know, the, the ruling uh, party. What is, why are you, why were you so vocal why, as a leader? And more pertinently, why are the rest of us so quiet? Yeah, I said, I'm, I'm struck by this because I think that there are two answers to this, One, uh, Jonathan. One is there are different visions of leadership. Um, and I'm struck by this in, in some ways. So, so I agree with you. I think that one of the important roles of a vice chancellor is to engage in the public discourse. Yes, there is the management role, steward an organization, get it to be financially sustainable, do all of those things. But in addition to that, that you need to play the role of public leader to inform the public discourse, to articulate a particular set of views to engage in the broader debates and force powerful stakeholders to confront the difficult questions of our time. Uh, and that is what I saw and I think that's what you saw. There are many others who don't see that 
as a fundamental role of the vice chancellor. They see the role of the vice chancellor, if you like, more as an executive manager, less as a public leader. And uh, I think that that's true of all systems. So I'm quite struck by what you just said. And you gave three or four examples where people wouldn't know. I'm almost certain that that's true of the UK. Uh, if you went to the UK, there are many, many vice chancellors who actually, uh, people would not engage in the public domain. They do not see themselves as playing that role. They see themselves as playing the role of an executive manager as an astute uh, manager, uh, rather than a manager, an executive manager plus a public leader. And so I think that they are, if you like, at the core, there are two different roots or views of what leadership are. And many, may, many vice chancellors adopt one or rather than the other. Uh, I uh, adopt the one that you identify with, but I suspect that the second is, is uh, there are many others who don't. The second thing I would say is I was able to play that role in part because of a particular history. I came from a political activist background. I came from a set of experiences uh, in UDW and elsewhere, where I learned from both the lessons, positive lessons, but also the mistakes that were made. And those diverse experiences were particularly uh, informed me uh, in that period. And the third thing that I come with is because I was activist, I wasn't flummoxed by it. So when, if you like, students start engaging in the theatrics of politics, in the theatrics of popular mobilization, as they did in many ways in the concourse in 2015, I could live with that. That didn't freak me out. Uh, I was there. I understood it. I had been party to those theatrics at different occasions in my life. And I don't mean theatrics in a in a bad way. I just mean it in, in the kind of symbolisms of struggle. Whereas for some people who had never had those experiences, those were frightening experiences. They, they feared them. They were threatened by them. And the discourse of political activists didn't, uh, didn't, didn't help because they used a language of uh, an inflammatory language that divided and threatened far more than they should have. Uh, they'd lost the logic of trying to conscientize. Uh, but I wasn't freaked by that. I could stare them down in a way because I had been party to that in many ways. I, I'll really? tell you, uh, yeah. I, I'll, I'll tell you the one final thing on this that captures this. I remember having a conversation with Nkrebo and Nkrebo said to me, I really don't like having you as a vice chancellor. I wish I had uh, Max Price. And I said, why do you want Max Price? And I, I don't think he understood Max Price had a, had a political background because he read from race, he read uh, an ideology. And I said, and he said to me, well, what irritates me is you've got some struggle history. So you know what we're doing even before we started. And, and in a sense, it's about having some experience of struggle in the kinds of ways that it was playing out and being able to navigate that world. And I think the people who succeeded in doing so had experience where if you were new to it, you were completely flummoxed by it. Well, well, there's two issues I want to come back to. One is Max and the other is the concourse. So let me start with the concourse. Um, because the concourse is, even for me, I mean, you were in Durban at the time. There was a higher education summit um, called by the minister. You rushed back uh, to bits because, you know, you got news um, that there's a major moment on campus. You know, I, you've explained it to me in our private meetings, but the image for many South Africans watching that of you sitting down on the concourse was often interpreted, right here on me, as they humiliated Abila, you know? What 
what was happening in that at that moment uh, at night? Um, were you scared? Um, I'm sure Fatima, your your good your wife, whom I know well, um, must have had a slightly different view <laughs> that you might have had as 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 an activist. But even I was a vice chancellor at the time. I mean, it it was scary not just because of what we saw you going through, but because of the potential. In fact, uh, 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 <laughs> one of the student leaders of the Free State uh, uh, said to me. Um, uh, Prof, can you come to the main hall? You know, our version of the Great Hall in Bloomberg Day. And would you mind sitting on the ground with us? <laughs> I said, do you, do you think I'm an idiot? Okay. Do you think I don't know what you're trying to do? You're trying to replicate the, the bits moment, and I will not be part of that, etc. Talk to us just a little bit more about, yeah. you know, perception. Yeah, so I'll, I'll say two things, and, 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 uh, uh, give some thoughts around humiliation and humility. Um, so um, the way it actually played out was as follows. I had flown back, as you said. The students uh, were coming in the next morning. I flew back on Friday morning, I think it was. Uh, I flew in on the six o'clock flight, was in Johannesburg in, in seven, had a quick shower at, at, the, at home and then went to the university. And the students uh, were congregating at the Yale Road entrance in Empire Road and wanted to meet. And I said, we'll go. And Pamela Dube and I, the Dean of Students and I went down. And of course, uh, at that point, it was Nampindulo and uh, Shahira who were leading this as two young uh, uh, women SRC members, uh, presidents actually. Uh, and uh, they effectively wouldn't let me speak. They wanted me to hear them. And so I was, I, I kind of uh, uh, played along. And immediately about an hour later came another group of activists, largely students, mainly male this time, led by Voyani Pambo and Mkaibo Dlamini, men activists. And they were uh, slightly more uh, uh, aggressive than uh, flamboyant, if you like. And that engagement happened uh, also at the Empire Road, out on the outside, I had security, etc. And then it became, by about 11 o'clock or upper ten, it had become quite hot. It was a really hot day. And it was Voyani Pamo said, can we move in? Because it's really hot sitting here. And I said, yes, sure. And ironically, at that point, security, Pamela said to me, First, the car is waiting behind the, the boom gates to take you off. And I said, no, I think it's time we saw this through. And ironically, the second person who told me that was Shahira Kala. She said to me, as a kind of woman SRC, perhaps you should leave. And I said, no, it's time to see this through. Because this ferment had been going on for like five or six days. And I said, let's see this through. So we then walked from Empire Road to the main hall and we walked in, uh, no, into the concourse, not to the main hall, we walked into the concourse. And when we sat down, actually, to be honest and to be fair to the student leaders, they had offered me a chair. And I had said, no, let's sit down. I'll sit with you. And I'd ask uh, um, a colleague of mine uh, who brought... Uh, some nuts because I used to love nuts. I was paranoid about getting a middle-aged porch. So I used to eat nuts rather than sweets and some coffee. And we sat down and with the student leaders. Now, by the way, I've done this a hundred times before. I did it three days before I had gone to Durban with some students at the business room. We kind of sat down uh, kind of on the floor. Uh, and then what had happened is obviously uh, initially, if you looked at that day, in the morning, the students were haranguing me about the vice chancellor from hell. By the afternoon, they were singing songs about the progressive vice chancellor, the comrade vice chancellor. When the TV cameras came in the evening, they were back to the morning's argument, neoliberal vice chancellor, and all of these things was, was playing itself out in, in that thing. Uh, the real issue about being hijacked emerged the next day. And when I spoke to the journalist who wrote the article, she said the headline was changed. 
because the hijack was used by 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 people by the newspaper and then the student leader said now that's a clever idea and in uct when they went in they asked the student the the vice chancellors to kneel uh, i when it is a voluntary act it's not humiliation when it becomes a forced act it is humiliation and when it originally started off um, i think uh, i had not seen it as a humiliation and there's a beautiful piece in business day by uh, what was the our professor edwards i can't believe it the names just come off my head uh, but uh, who used to be the editor of the of of uh, the mail and guardian anton arbel um, anton anton arbel and anton writes a beautiful piece in business day i think about the distinction between humility and humiliation and he was making the case he makes a beautiful distinction but i think he applies it incorrectly because he applies it to wedem and tash and says that wedem and tash should have acted with humility and sat down but i my view was that actually he was being forced to and it wasn't then an act of humility it was an act of humiliation when i did it of my own volition it was an act of humility not a humiliation and i think that that distinction is not sufficiently understood the second and final thing i would say in this regard that act of sitting down was powerfully symbolic and it was powerfully important because what nobody could uh, accuse me of was not being willing to talk i sat for 24 hours in a concourse and engaged students and when i had to act the following year when there was violence on campus and i brought in police it was the political legitimation of sitting down in 2015 that allowed us to pull the more uh, firm action of 2016 when we had to call in police because there was a threat to human beings and there was a threat to property and one cannot understand the one without the other and often i think people have not made the link so you would not believe how many political leaders how many senior black figures came to me and said thank you for sitting down in 2015 uh, and it was precisely we were able to retain their support in 2016 precisely because of the act of 2015 mm. and see this as part of a similar narrative I, uh, that is very very helpful i i've not heard you even to me explain that so well and i think this notion of humiliation versus humility uh, uh louise is something worth pondering uh in leadership discussions that we are yet to have i want to talk to another point that you briefly uh, referenced and that is uh the inevitable comparison certainly my friends at at uct were saying this okay Uh, if 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 max now max as you know is also a good friend of both of us so this is not about uh uh him per se but if max only did what adam did if max only stared down the 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 so called radicals um you know and stopped them from destroying artworks and and you know and punching him etc uh, uh, etc et um and so there was in high education a lot of discussion unfair on its terms i would say but nevertheless there about the 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 bib model and the price model okay and 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 what i'd like to ask you um to what extent was the uct struggle in those two vital years different or similar to what happened at wits in other words was max's response a contextually based response uh which made it different from you or was his strategy wrong so i mean max and i max is a great friend and i i want to say that he and i have a difference of opinion and for those who are interested in this i've reflected at this a little bit of this in the book on uh rebels and rage uh, where i tell the story about where i think in three of two or three pages the difference between max's price strategy and mine and actually max responds to this in the daily maverick uh 
Uh, and if, if you're interested, you can, the people can pick this up about Max's response. Max's argument is that it was contextual, that his ability to move uh, and the reason there was a difference between what he did and what I did. And part of the reason of what he did was contextually grounded, the very nature and architecture of UCT, the fact that it was located on a mountain, the fact that it was an open campus and not a closed campus like WITS, the fact that uh, all of these things. I, on the other hand, I've argued that I think that there's some uh, something to say for the contextual differences, but I don't think that that explains all of it. And I think that there are two big differences that allowed us to pull forward a much more firmer agenda and an agenda that established firm parameters. One was at the level of strategy and tactics. And the second is at the level of what I call a cohesive team. Strategy and tactics, we refer, were very willing to take a much firmer hand against individuals who violated the free space, who threatened the students or who threatened the campus. We were willing to take forward disciplinary hearings and we were willing to, uh, to challenge that in powerful ways. And I think part of that was simply tactical. I understood that actually if we didn't, we would lose Wits. I think Wits could have been lost in those years in a way that that wouldn't have necessarily happened at UCT. But I think it was particularly important to do so. But the second is the fact that I think Wits retained a much more cohesive team. It wasn't a fractured team. It wasn't a divided team. And it was a team that sang from this same hymn sheet. So I'll be clear with you. When I walked in, we would meet very regularly every morning. And I had a very strong, with my senior executive team, which was the five deans and the DVCs and myself and, and the CFO and the COO, we were very clear. We will differ vociferously with each other in the room. You can differ with me. You can disagree with me. But once we have cast a pathway, one, once we have decided on a course of action, everybody sings from the same hymn sheet. This is a cohesive management response. And frankly, that was agreed to by the team. So I didn't have deans and or DVCs taking a completely different course of action to the vice chancellor. There was a course of action. And frankly, I had, the, I had a similar approach from my council, very clear. You hold me accountable. Here's my strategy. Here's what I'm doing. Now step back and you have to back me. And Randall Carellison did that. And Isaac Shongwe did that. Uh, and that I think made the big difference. What okay. I understood playing out is that different DVCs or different managers did different things at UCT. And what that allowed is political activists to play them against each other and create huge confusion in the institution. Nobody in WITS knew, everybody in WITS knew what our course of action was. They might not agree with it, but they knew what the course of action was. In, mm. in UCT, there was confusion. Yeah, that is very, very helpful. Um, uh, Adam, I, I sadly only have one uh, question left because I have to give Louise a chance to read to you some of the questions that came up in the chat box. So uh, we have talked about this uh, at various points, but I, I do need to ask you this and I, I hope you are a bit more at liberty to, to be frank about this now that you're outside of the um, We have functional universities, WITS, UCT, Stellenbosch, UWC, etc. And we have a lot of dysfunctional universities, universities that suck up huge amounts, billions in resources from the state for teaching and learning, but also for research and have nothing to show for it. The uh, universities that close down uh, regularly as a result of disruptions, uh, there's been 17 assessor reports 
uh, uh, most of which, not all, led to administrators being appointed. Some of those universities, like Walter Sisudu, Fort Hare, Bal Triangle, have had more than one intervention by the minister that shut them down and brought in administrators. Surely this can't go on. Surely the extent to which those universities still, you know, pretend to be like a bit in terms of research uh, and, and all of that, draws vital resources away from the more functional universities at a point where a lot of those universities, that's a, a point where can no longer be described as white universities. I mean, unless you're living, you know, in another world, your student body, for example, is emphatically transformed, et cetera, et cetera, and need those resources. We won't bite on the differentiation bullet, right? Which means create different kinds of institutions for our economy. Um, is there a way out of this? So, I mean, I must say, I'm really worried about this. I don't think that the issue of higher education is an issue of money. I think this is the, higher, the, the problem of higher education is an issue of political will. That actually what we need to do as an institution, as a sector, is to differentiate our institutions, have research institutions, have teaching institutions, uh, if you like, have vocational colleges and we need to create a pathway, a systemic uh, part of different types of institutions with different mandates. We don't have that. I mean, we have that by, by market uh, design, by just yeah. the, the, the evolution of the market as opposed to by design. And we have pretenses. And frankly, that is destroying us. So for instance, let me just give you the latest resources that we've put in and, uh, as a result of Jacob Zuma's decision in 2017 through uh, NIF NISFAS has resulted in about anything between 30 and 40 billion extra going into higher education. That given the nature of the demographics of our society and where poor people go to, that results, the majority of that goes into the poorest of the institutions, the historically black campuses, and particularly the universities of technology. If you can prove to me that in the last three years, they are more stable as a result, I can say that was money well spent. I can guarantee you they no more stable in 2021 than they were in 2018 or than they were in 2016. And if that's the case, we've just blown 40 billion worth of rands every year without getting any substantive outcome in educational quality or, or throughput in the way we are. And that's the question that we have to start asking. Are we spending money badly? And my argument is, yes, we are. And we don't have the courage to say this, and we don't have the political will to differentiate, to establish appropriate mandates, and to have the courage to make the right appointments. The reason historically black councils, by the way, are weaker than the councils of historically black universities is because government has had carte blanche in making cadre deployment onto them. That's partly the problem. And they wouldn't dare do it at a Stellenbosch or a Wits because they'll know they'll be pushed back. Yeah. And so you've been treating these institutions. And so we're paying the consequence for that. So I think, I think it's fixable. That's the irony. And I think you could have a dramatic impact both for growth, but it requires political will. And frankly, government has not had the political will to demonstrate significant leadership in this regard. And for me, that's the issue. Is sometimes you have to worry less about the short-term political gains or the short-term political image you want to maintain. You know, somebody said to me often, why do you do this job? Well, I said to be often people at this, I took this job. I didn't anticipate some of the difficult decisions that need to be made. But God, I'm not going to abandon this job. My responsibility requires me to make this decision and I'll make it the best I can. I didn't choose the cards that were dealt to me, but I will not refuse to do the job that needs to be done. And too many people in our political system, I think duck the job that needs to be done when the hard trade-offs need to be made. 
Thanks very much, Adam. I'm going to hand over to Louise, and could I ask you, just because we have five minutes left and want to respect your time and the audience, if you could just give very short answers, Adam, if you don't mind, to the many questions. And Louise. Yes. Yeah, I don't think we're going to we're going to use this time to kind of go through all those questions. Adam, I just want to say from my side, um, I now know who I want to have as Minister of Higher Education. I hope this SOAS thing isn't going to be last too long, that you can come back and do the job that you've clearly been groomed to do because of your experience. Um, there are some questions in the chat box. One is about early childhood development, which clearly is, is a concern for many people in our community. And, um, and, and the question is, how do we get everybody in the system to understand how important it is? Because I'm sure that you would agree that we feel the pain of, the, of not having good foundational education in the, in the universities. It's when Professor O'Connell many, many years ago told me, he says, he loves his students at UWC. The problem is that they can't read. And when students arrive at university and they can't read, that's a problem for higher education. So just so Pam can ask the question around how do we, why do we need to get early childhood education back on track, foundational education? What would you recommend with regard to that? Um, I, someone asked the question around how do we make this more accessible, but I've just realized I didn't know that your book Rebels and Rage definitely needs to be read. And then I, the, the last question is, how do we get young people actively engaged as citizens to co-create a better future? But I don't think it's just young people. How do we get everybody in South Africa to realize it's in our hands? If we're going to continue to wait for government, we are, we, this country doesn't have a future. So, so there's a few questions, Adam, and, and we recognize that we only have a little bit of time. We should have made this a two-hour call, but we... Mm. So my answer to this is very quickly, two, three, three statements very quickly in the next three minutes. So first is on early childhood development. I think it's absolutely necessary. That's where we should be putting resources. It's tied to the Jonathan question. If it's true, we're blowing 40 billion a year. If we had that money, that's okay. But if we took that money from early childhood development, why aren't we putting 40 billion in early childhood development, so you create the appropriate pipeline across the system. And it seems to me misaligned priorities, and that misaligned priorities is a result of the failure of political will. That's the point I'm making. It's not resources. It's the difficulty of managing trade-offs and political will. Citizens, you're absolutely right. They have to be found. And I think that part of this, by the way, in universities can be through forcing students. I, I, you know, I was once in an uh, Israeli institution at uh, Ben Gurion, and one of the most fascinating things, as part of the course, they had students that had to go out to work in old age homes. They had to, all students, they had to go and work in, uh, in farms. They had to go clean public service as part of the obligation to give back. And I think that this is something that we need to seriously think about. And then finally, I saw Ashraf Garda's question and I can't resist it. And I would say two things to that. He asks about legacy. My question is, my legacy will be determined in the long term by the long term outcomes. And that is determined for other people to de de develop, not me. My job is to do what is the right thing at a particular moment. And that, for me, is the big question of the day. What my legacy is, I'll leave to the historians to write in future generations. I'll stop there. Thank you. So I want to be respectful of our, our, our agreement to end at, at 6 o'clock. I really do think both of you, uh, we, we need more of these kind of conversations. We need more conversations where those with the struggle credentials can fire the rest of us up. I'm certainly fired up after this conversation. Thank you so much, um, Professor Habib. Thank you so much, Professor Janssen. Professor Janssen dreamt up the series and he contacted me over the holidays and it felt to me, Professor Janssen, as, as if, you know, it's my dream come true when you said, please, can we do the series? So I feel so privileged to be able to sit in on all of these calls. Thank you for everybody who joined. Uh, we'll be continue to have conversations. Uh, we did send you the invitation or the information about the next two conversations with Dr. Mampella Rampella and 
Archbishop Tabo Mahoba. And I want to say to you, watch this space. It's going to get even, you know, just continue to get more interesting. Um, Professor Habib, I, um, yeah, I can't say thank you enough to both of you. And this, we've just had a fantastic conversation and a fantastic opportunity to be part of this. Good luck in London. It's going to get very, it's thank nice. Thank you guys. Months, and then you. it's going to be very cold over Christmas. So, and then you're going to miss us even more. So <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks, guys. Take it easy, man. Bye.